Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. Church on the Rock family, here we are, sort of, here you are, Uh, but let me tell you where I am this weekend. I had the opportunity um, present itself this weekend to do something with two of my daughters. Uh, Last year, about this time, I took my daughter Adlin out ice fishing for the first time mostly because I've never enjoyed ice fishing. But I took her out ice fishing with a friend to a remote cabin, snow machining in. It was 25 below zero, and she loved it. And she has been waiting for an entire year to take her sister Katie with us as well. And so Monday, the opportunity came up, presented itself. And so I brought it to the team. I said, what do you guys think about me taking my daughters out ice fishing this weekend? And they were like, go for it. But I also wanted to be the one to introduce our new series to you. Bliss. Uh, Really what we're looking at is a focus on marriage. Don't miss the bliss. Um, I'm looking today uh, at the act of marriage and the art of making it work. The act of marriage and the art of making it in marriage. And so I'm actually out at the cabin ice fishing with my girls, but I also get to be here with you introducing this critical topic for us as a church. And so we're going to be digging into this today. I really want you to buckle up, to dial in. I also want to say this on the front end. We're going to be talking about some things. We're going to reading, uh, be reading some passages of Scripture that you may be tempted to hear something that isn't being said. There are lots of challenging situations in marriage. And I just want you to know that all we're trying to do is define and describe biblical marriage and then also put some tools in your tool belt that will help your marriage thrive and succeed. And the reality is that all of us come with filters and experiences and wounds. And when we look at these things, we're tempted to view them from the perspective that God has it out for me, that he doesn't understand my situation, that he's chauvinistic, that He is none of those things. What he desires is that you would thrive in your marriage relationship. And so my prayer as we jump into this is that you would be able to identify when something's being triggered that maybe isn't necessarily being said and that you could hear what it is that the Holy Spirit wants to say to us today. Which brings me to poetic license. The rabbis describe the scriptures as um, this beautiful jewel, the Old Testament scriptures for them. And they described it as a jewel for this reason, that whenever you turned that jewel, you would see some different refraction or reflection of light as a result of what angle you were looking at it from. And they described the scriptures in this way, that the scriptures could be mulled on, meditated on, thought about. And each time you looked at them again, you could discover some new aspect of God's character of his love for us, of his passion. You would discover something new about God, something new about yourself. The scriptures were much like that. And those kinds of discoveries take time and they take meditation. It's especially true of poetic literature in the scriptures, like the Song of Songs or Ecclesiastes or Psalms. Those types of books are actually written in a poetic 
language, which means you don't necessarily take them literally. They're rarely descriptive of how you must act, and they're more, uh, they're often descriptive, I mean, of how you should respond, or, but not necessarily prescriptive in the exact way or outcome that you should expect. And the Song of Songs is very much that way. It, most of my life, when I heard someone talk about the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, as it's often referred to, they were talking about it as it's, um, it's an allegory about our love relationship with Jesus, which is kind of cool if you're a woman, and it's super weird if you're a guy, <laughs> just to be honest. Uh, uh, but the reality is that I think the Song of Songs is actually about exactly what it appears to be about. Love, passion, romance, sexuality, because God actually cares about those things. And he gives us this book, this poetic imagery of two people who are madly in love with one another, trying to tame their passions and desires, trying to display what it looks like at the right time for those things to be expressed. That's why Jewish boys weren't allowed to read it until they were 18 years old. And I'm going to read some of chapter 8 today. And so, you know, if you're concerned about your 17-year-old sitting next to you, like get the earmuffs out or something, uh, get over it. Uh, But I just want to read a little bit of the Song of Songs. And I want you to hear it as God's description of romance and passion and sexuality. Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 3. Your left arm, the woman says, your left arm would be under my head and your right arm would embrace me. Promise me, O women of Jerusalem, not to awaken love until the time is right. Listen, friends of mine, girlfriends, do not get me stirred up before the time is right because this fire is burning in me. The young women of Jerusalem Who is this sweeping in from the desert, leaning on her lover? You are radiant as you are coming towards us. You're with the man you desire. The young woman has this to say, I aroused you under the apple tree where your mother gave you birth. Just want to clarify, not when your mother gave you birth, like in the place of your home. I aroused you under the apple tree where your mother gave you birth where in great pain she delivered you. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire, the brightest kind of flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. The young woman's brothers have something to say about this relationship as well. Here's her brothers. This will sound familiar. We have a little sister, too young to have breasts. Awkward. What will we do for our sister if someone asks to marry her? How will we protect her? How will we help her find the right one? If she is a virgin, like a wall, we will protect her with a silver tower. But if she is promiscuous, like a swinging door, we will block her door with a cedar bar. Like we're going to protect our sister, even when she is passionate. The young woman responds, I was a virgin like a wall. Now my, whoo, it's getting weird. Breasts are like towers. When my lover looks at me, he is delighted with what he sees. Solomon has a vineyard of Baal Haman, which he leases out to tenant farmers. Each of them pays a thousand pieces of silver for harvesting its fruit. But my vineyard is mine to give, and Solomon need not pay a thousand pieces of silver, but I will give 200 pieces to those who care for its vines. In other words, I own my own body, and I will give it to the one I believe is worthy. The young man, here's what he has to say. Oh, my darling, linger in the gardens. Your companions are fortunate to hear your voice. Let me hear it too. And the young woman says, come away, my love. Be like a gazelle or a stag on the mountains of spices. And we'll just stop there because like you can go home and read it together. I would strongly recommend it. You're going to have a good time with the imagery that's presented in the Song of Songs. But this brings me to fish love. 
was an old rabbi who was walking by a man enjoying a meal of fish. And he said to the man who was eating the fish, he, was, he said, you seem to be enjoying that fish. And the man responded with this, oh, oh, I love fish. Love's a funny word. We, we use it for all kinds of things. We would say, if you asked us, no, I love this differently than I love that. But we sort of throw this word around, this fish love, this experiential love, this self-gratifying love. He didn't actually love the fish or he wouldn't have killed it. <laughs> he loved what the fish gave him. I, I refer to this also as consumer love. Consumer love is that kind of love that our relationships often begin with. It isn't necessarily evil. It's unhealthy if it's all it ever is. But fish love or consumer love is really primarily focused on how we feel when we're with that person or what we personally want from that relationship. There's nothing wrong with having desires and wants in a relationship, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to feel good when you're with that person, but often relationships begin this way. They're consumer love. They're primarily focused on what I get and what I want, and they never mature beyond that. The Song of Songs, actually, to be entirely honest, spends the bulk of its time unveiling the early days of love. What it looks like when infatuation is there. I often refer to this as the blissful ignorance days. When no matter what anyone told you, no matter what caution they gave you, even if they said to you, you do realize he lives in his mom's basement, he doesn't have a job, he's 32 years old, and he spends all day gaming in his underwear, and you're like, but he's my beloved. Uh, like those days when your mind can get so fixated on one thing that you can't seem to see anything else. It's also this um, incapacitating infatuation. And at some point in our relationships, reality seems to set in. What happens after the wedding bells are done and the honeymoon is over? What are the elements of love that lasts and a marriage that endures? And how do we capture those things? Which brings me to a matter of definitions. There are really three big questions that I want to address in our few moments here together. The first one is, what is marriage? The second one is, why does marriage exist? And the last one is, how does marriage work? In other words, how do I have a lasting and fulfilling marriage? And I want to begin with addressing this issue of what is marriage by talking about what marriage is not. The first thing I would say that marriage is not, and this is a little bit confusing in our culture, and so bear with me because we're describing a biblical perspective of marriage. What marriage is not is marriage is not committed, but not covenant. Committed does not equal biblical marriage. I have this conversation far more often than I'm comfortable with where I'm talking with a couple and they've chosen not to actually get married, to not make a covenant with one another. They've just said we're committed to one another and that's sufficient to enjoy the benefits of marriage. But from a biblical perspective, that isn't the case. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 5 through 7, describe it in this way. Has anyone just built a house, just planted a vineyard? Has anyone here just become engaged to a woman, but not yet married her? I'm committed to her. I gave her a ring. I said, I'm going to marry you. We're committed to each other. But he makes a distinction that commitment isn't actually marriage, I've committed to her. Is anyone here who is engaged to a woman but not yet married to her? Well, you may go home and get 
married. There's a distinction that the scriptures make between simply a personal commitment to you between the two of us and a covenant relationship with one another. The second thing that marriage is not is marriage is not cohabitation and sexual relationship. Cohabitation and sexual relations do not equal biblical marriage. That simply because we've chosen to live together and we've chosen to have a sexual relationship and we've said we're committed to one another, but we're just trying this thing out to see if it really works, statistically has been really unhealthy for people. In fact, the vast majority of cohabitating situations ultimately do not end in saying we're good together or for one another. They typically end in separation. But from a biblical perspective, simply living together and having a sexual relationship does not equal a biblical marriage. So then what a biblical marriage is. In fact, John chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, you've probably heard the story at some point where Jesus encounters the woman at the well. It's a beautiful story. It's a really gracious story. She's the first one, a woman, a Samaritan woman, gets to go and proclaim that Jesus the Messiah has come. It's a really powerful story. But in the story, there are some details revealed about her life. And listen to Jesus' description of her relationship. He asks her if she's married. She says, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Jesus makes a distinction between living together in a relationship together and marriage. There's a reason that he makes this distinction. So what a biblical marriage is. The first thing that I think we cannot ignore from a biblical perspective is that a biblical marriage is one man and one woman. In fact, Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Throughout the entirety of the scriptures, God's definition of marriage is between a man and a woman, one man and one woman. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, what about all of the relationships where these men have a hundred wives or two wives or a thousand wives in Solomon's case? Like, what about those situations? And what I would say to that is God never said he approved of it. He is just telling you the truth of their situation. Don't assume that God approves of something simply because the scriptures state something. What God established in the Garden of Eden all the way into our present day is this relationship between one man and one woman. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says this, For I feel divine jealousy for you, since I, Paul writing, betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. You're the woman, right? The church is the bride of Christ, and I've presented you to Jesus. It's between one man and one woman. The second thing that a biblical marriage is, is this. Biblical marriage is a lifelong and binding covenant relationship. It's more than I just want you to know I'm committed to you just between the two of us, but it's actually something that we've said we want to say before all of you. We have made a covenant with one another. We are committed for life in a covenant relationship. You're going to discover in a moment why this is really important because actually your marriage is about something much bigger than you or me. A lifelong binding covenant relationship. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. This is the accusation that God has against the nation of Israel and against its leaders. The Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. 
this idea that this is intended to be a binding and covenant relationship is rooted in the idea that God has a binding and covenant relationship with us. Romans chapter seven, verse two describes it in this way. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. You could flip it around and the same thing is true for the man as is true for the woman. It's intended to be a lifelong and binding relationship. In fact, I would say it in this way. Biblical marriage is intended to be a covenant relationship between one man and one woman for life. Or biblical marriage is intended to be a lifelong covenant relationship between one man and one woman. Now, if you're listening to this, um, statistically, 50% or more have experienced divorce or separation. And I want you to understand God has been in the redemption business a really long time. And there's nothing wrong with coming to a clear understanding of God's intention, although we often have no control over the other person's action. What we're describing is God's desire and what we know we need often is God's grace. So why did God design marriage? Why did God put this institution in place? And I think there's three primary reasons that he did it. And the first one is this. He wants godly offspring, kiddos. Like, like God wants couples. He starts in Genesis. He tells Adam and Eve this, right? Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and rule it well. Teach your children to rule it well. Now I recognize Kitri and I dealt with infertility for 14 years before we got involved in foster care and ultimately adoption, that there are situations in which that just isn't a possibility, or maybe you're called to singleness, but the ability to disciple or raise up a generation We actually all have that capacity. But in the marriage union, God desires for this to be a part of it. In fact, Malachi chapter 2 verse 15 says this, did he not make them husband and wife? Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. What does God desire from your union? He desires godly offspring. He desires that you raise up kids who love him and change the world. That's one of the things that he wants. The second thing that he wants, and you're gonna like this, he actually wants us to experience joy and pleasure. Why did God design marriage? Because he wants us, he desires that we experience immense joy and pleasure, aka bliss. Maybe you came into the marriage relationship thinking it was never about you, it was not about you, that you shouldn't expect joy or pleasure, but that would actually not be a biblical description of why God designed marriage. When you look at the scriptures like Proverbs chapter 18, 22, it says this, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing. I hope the same is true of wives. Whoever finds a husband finds a good thing, but it's intended to be good, pleasurable, enjoyable. If you were to follow that on, Proverbs 5, 18, and 19, I love this one. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving doe and a graceful, loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her, <clears throat> you know what that part says, always satisfy you. May you always be captivated by her love. It's actually the reason that things like pornography and fantasy life are so dangerous and devastating because what they do is rob you and your spouse of this part of the marriage relationship. It puts a substitute in there that will never ultimately satisfy and you are robbed of a key element of what the marriage relationship was intended to be. 
I love this one, Ecclesiastes 9.9, because, you know, he's a little bit of an Eeyore in Ecclesiastes. And he says, live joyfully with your wife, whom you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. Like, listen, we're all going to die. All of our possessions are going to be distributed to someone else. What's the point? And he says, but there is something. Live joyfully with your spouse. Whatever life brings, it's intended to bring joy in this relationship. And God designed marriage because he wants godly offspring and he wants us to experience joy and pleasure. And the last reason is this, because he wants to display the gospel and his glory through our relationship. I think most of us tend to wonder why I should engage, why I should invest in my marriage when things are so bad. Why is it worth fighting for? And there's a principle here that we often miss. The principle is actually found in Ephesians chapter five. It's a passage of scripture that um, used to be really popular in wedding ceremonies, but because of one specific word, it has fallen out of favor. In fact, I rarely hear it in marriage ceremonies anymore. And this passage in Ephesians is actually a critical passage for our understanding of why God designed the marriage relationship. And before I get to Ephesians 5, verse 22, I actually want to read Ephesians 5, verse 21, because this is where Ephesians and the marriage portion actually begins. It begins with this. And furthermore, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's that word submit. It's the word we hate. It's the word we don't like. It's the word we actually misunderstand. But here's what I want you to know. Before he describes the wife's role and then the husband's role and then the mystery, he actually begins by letting you know that there is a mutual submission to one another. There are roles that we play in our marriage relationship that make it flourish, but there is also this requirement to respect one another, to honor one another, to come under the correction of one another whenever something that we're doing is out of line with God and his purposes and calling. My wife, Kitri, has the freedom to speak to me at any moment in regards to things that she observes that I'm doing that are outside of the bounds of what Christ has called me to. I expect that that would happen because I'm also to submit to the Lord through her as well. But here comes the rest. Be patient. Don't let your triggers go off. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should also submit to your husbands and everything. I want to key in on two things. I want to key in on this word, everything. Because there are clearly moments when a husband is behaving outside the bounds of Christ's likeness asking for things outside the bounds of what Christ would ask for? If your husband wants you to watch pornography with him as some arousing thing, he is clearly outside the bounds of what God has called us to. He's creating a substitute and leading you into sin also, and you should say, no, I will not do that. There are moments when you should and are required to stand up and say no. This is not what that's speaking about. It's actually speaking about in a healthy relationship when you are respectful towards, when you have honor for, when you are willing to come under the leadership, which is intended to be a particular kind of leadership, then you will actually begin to flourish. So he moves on to the man. And I just want to say this, in Ephesians chapter 5, he will literally spend twice as many words giving instruction to men as he does to women. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. He gave up his own ambitions for her. He gave up his own desires for her. He gave up his own pursuits and pleasures for her in order to make her 
holy, and clean. Washed by the cleansing of God's word, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself that when we display Christ-like sacrificial love, serving love towards our wives, we are actually displaying what Christ has been like to us. When I'll spend the same amount of money on her that I would spend on me for the things I love, when I'm willing to pour my life out for her, I'm beginning to love her in the way that Christ loves the church. When I lead her into spiritual maturity, when I help her understand what God is like and help her grow in her relationship with him, making her holy and clean, I'm actually doing what I'm required to do in my marriage relationship. Here it comes Ephesians chapter five, moving into these last few verses. And we are members of his, Christ's body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now here it is, Ephesians 5, 32. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. What's the illustration? Your marriage is the illustration to the world, to your children of Christ and the church, where there's repentance and forgiveness and submission and love and care and sacrifice. You model Jesus when you understand what he's really speaking about here. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. If this love and respect were present in our relationship, we actually begin to fulfill God's ultimate purpose for marriage. In fact, I would say it this way. This is the principle. Your marriage, my marriage, is intended to be a living, functioning illustration of Christ's relationship with his church. That's why marriage matters. It matters to God because he created this institution. Man didn't create it. The Supreme Court didn't create it. They can have legal unions or whatever. But when we talk about marriage, it's actually an institution that God created in order to display what his relationship with his bride is like. That's why your marriage is under attack. That's why it's hard to forgive. That's why the enemy leads us into sexual temptations that create devastation in our relationships. He leads us into those things because he recognizes that if our marriages modeled the gospel and the glory of God in the way they were intended to, the world would be transformed even just through the raising of our own children. It's worth fighting for because you're being fought against for that reason. Because the enemy knows. From the creation of the world, he has been fighting against relationships between husbands and wives. And he's doing it today. Which brings me to IQ isn't everything. Albert Einstein was married. I'm not saying it was a good idea for Albert Einstein to be married, but he was married. He got married in 1903. And in 1987, they found some love letters of his. They were actually letters written to his wife. In in 1914, their marriage had started to deteriorate, but Einstein had an idea that if she just knew what his expectations were, then their marriage could work just fine. And so the brilliant man, Albert Einstein, wrote down his list of expectations for his wife, and we now have them. Let me share them with you. Go ahead and take notes, husbands. Um, But here we go. Number one, you will make sure One, my clothes and laundry are kept in good order, that I will receive my meals three times regularly in my room, that my bedroom and study are kept neat, and that my desk is left for my use only. Number two, you will renounce all personal relations with me insofar as they are not completely necessary for social reasons. Specifically, you will forego my sitting at home with you and my going out or traveling with you. 
Number three, this is helping, isn't it? Number three, you will obey the following points in your relations with me. You will not expect any intimacy from me, nor will you reproach me in any way. You will, you will stop talking to me if I request it. And you will leave my bedroom or study immediately without protest if I request it. I'm fairly certain from the moment she opened this, she quit talking to him. But number four, here it is. You will not belittle me in front of our children, either through words or behavior. And Einstein was certain that if she just knew what his expectations were, clear communication, everything would be better. I I just want to remind you, IQ isn't everything. Like, I'm sure he could have come up with an equation that would have made it abundantly clear to him the gravity of this situation. Five years later, they divorced. She moved out and he got at least his middle two requests that she would expect no personal relations with him and that she would not expect intimacy from him and she certainly wasn't talking to him anymore. He later married a lady named Elsa and here's his description of her. She is a great cook and housekeeper. Can I just tell you, that is not what your marriages were designed to be. He has entirely, with all of his brilliance, missed the point of this union, missed his role in this union, missed an opportunity that was greater than anything he could ever bring to the world in science or mathematics. He could have helped people connect the dots, see the equation between our relationship with Christ and his love for us, but he missed it. I would say this, marriage really wouldn't be so difficult if it wasn't for the people involved. The truth is, none of us have nailed it. None of us have gotten it all right. None of us have perfectly kept all of our vows. We're actually called to display something in this relationship that supersedes our failures and our weaknesses. Which brings me to the shelf life of a Twinkie. Because if you were to look at the statistics for marriage, they can be rather alarming, but I'd rather arm you than alarm you. So here we go. A little bit of Twinkie history. In 1930, the Twinkie was created. Um, in 1940, they tried to switch it to banana, and then they switched it back to vanilla immediately. Someone was paying attention there. But in November of 2012, Hostess declared bankruptcy. And all of the preppers, all of the people in their mom's basement playing video games, all of the zombie apocalypse people went into sheer panic because there were few things that had the shelf life of a Twinkie. Like you could find one and it would taste the same today as it did back in 1930. And so um, all of a sudden there was this panic, but fortunately by March of 2013, it was rescued and they were purchased by another company. July of 2013, the return of the Twinkie came. Twinkies are legendary for their shelf life. And here's the reason that Twinkies last so much longer than their other cream-filled pastry counterparts. It isn't actually the type of ingredients necessarily. It's actually the type of ingredients and the amount of those ingredients. The secret to the shelf life of a Twinkie is the ingredients, not just the right ingredients, but the amount of the right ingredients. And I would say that the secret to the shelf life of a marriage is love, not just any kind of love, not fish love, not consumer love, but the right kind of love in the right amounts. I want to look back at the Song of Songs because there's something to identify in verse 6 of chapter 8 and verse 7. Listen to me describe it. Just listen to it. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. What she's saying is, I long to be legally bound to you. I long to be in a covenant relationship with you. I long for commitment because commitment and covenant is the foundation. 
It's the sure thing till death do us part. I'm not leaving. I'm here. It gives you room to grow, to make mistakes, to flex. But if that commitment isn't there, she's saying, I want to be like a seal over your heart, like the seal on your arm that they all know you're of the king's household. Would you identify me? Would I be bound to you? For love is as strong as death. She's saying, till death do us part. That love is so strong that it could not be separated by anything other. Its jealousy is, in, is as enduring as the grave. In other words, I'm putting all the other ladies on notice. All the single ladies, listen up. I put a ring on it. This is my man. Don't you dare get involved in our relationship. This is us. You don't get to weigh in on it. Like there is this level of commitment that I'm pushing all others out. Love flashes like fire, the brightest kind of fire. The ESV uses the word here, like the fire of the Lord. It's really saying that passion is hot and consuming. It's supposed to be there. That passion in your relationship must exist. And if it's gone, then you got to figure out how to get it back because you and I both know this about fire. Fire requires fuel. It's why things like pornography are so dangerous. Because you're not fueling the fire of your passion for one another. You're creating a substitute that is just a flash in the pan and then it's gone. But if passion's going to exist between the two of you, it has to be nurtured. You have to put wood on it and gasoline on it to get it to flourish. Then she says, many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. In the hardest times under the deluge of rain, it will endure. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. Listen, you can't buy what I freely give. It is the gospel that Jesus, no matter where we find ourselves, that while we were yet sinners, laid his life down for us that you could never buy his love. It was freely given to you. You couldn't earn it and you can't lose it then. I would say the ingredients for this kind of consummate love, as they call it, are passion, intimacy, knowing and being known, desire, sexual drive, longing, passion, intimacy, and commitment. And when those are all three present in healthy measure, your marriage will thrive in the way God intended. I'm gonna end with this. I wanna invite you to go ahead and stand with us. 1 Corinthians 13. You've heard it before. It's a description of love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I could fathom all mysteries and I have all knowledge and I have faith that can actually move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I give my body over to the hardships that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Now here is the description. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. I'm better than you. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. There's something you need to know. When the scriptures use words like submit or submission, it doesn't equal silence because love speaks the truth, but love never quits never gives up. Love protects and defends. There are decisions that you and I sometimes have to make because of the situations that others put us in. But if love isn't present, 
if it isn't observable, if there's no fruit or evidence of it in accordance with 1 Corinthians 13, then we delude ourselves into believing that we're actually loving when we're not. Here's the thing, good luck having that kind of love consistently. I can think of a time as recently as this week where my love failed. It wasn't perfect or this kind of love. And what I need ultimately is the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to love in the way that I'm called to and repent when I fail to. So Jesus, I pray for the people in this room, the people watching online, for those who will hear this in the future. Would you cause a soft heart to begin to beat again in us? Would you show us the way forward? Holy Spirit, would you come even in this moment and would you fill us with your presence and your power because we admit we cannot do this without you. So would you grant us the gift of experiencing health and life and vitality. We don't need more definitions or descriptions or reasons or people to blame. What we need is the transforming work of you, Jesus, in our lives. May you fill our marriages so that they flourish. And may we display through a living, functioning illustration to the world of what it looks like to be in relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's worship, church. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play. Thank you.